All right, so uh, navigate to kotlin.cs.illinois.edu. That is the website for the class. It is a work in progress. For now, it's a push down queue of information. Um, so if you guys have taken 125 with me, you know that I like to, you know, I like to sort of experiment with things. I like to write code in class. I like to run things and see what's happening. So we have basically the same playground system that we use for 125 that's built into this page. Um, you guys should be able to follow along, um, edit the examples, run the examples. Um, both the Java and the Kotlin examples are, interact are interactive. There are some snippets of Python code here. The Python code is not interactive. Um, but you know it's here for for reference. The so let's get started. So so today is um, I'm not going to promise it's going to be the most interesting day. Uh, that we're going to do some sort of preliminaries just to get ourselves sort of familiarized with some of the basics, right? I am not assuming. I think some of you probably have some pretty extensive programming experience in the past. Um, I'm not assuming that. You know, I'm assuming people at the level of having taken 125. So I want to sort of walk through. Pretty much what we'll try to get through today is everything that we've covered in 125 up till this point in the semester. It's about like three classes worth of material. Um, I think I can go a little bit faster here because of the, the level of the audience, but I do want to make sure that we have a shared base of understanding that we can work off of as we, we, we go on uh, this semester. Okay, so let me uh, start off by just talking about some basic uh, features of the interactive slides and the way that we're going to interact with our code. So, um, so printing. Um, if you guys have messed around with Kotlin, so uh, Kotlin's print statement is Printlin. Um, this is sort of, I think, inspired by Java's system.out.printlin, which you know has to be one of the most unfriendly uh, printing primitives available on the planet. Um, so in Kotlin, we simplify this to just uh, Printlin. Um, it's similar to print, I guess, in Python. Um, so I don't know why. Oh, I must have just broken that one. Okay, so this is how this would work in Kotlin. I think the rest of these are going to be fine. Um, all right, so that's how we print things. And of course, we're going to be using that throughout these examples to kind of try to understand what's going on, what the values of things are, and how the code is executed. Mm -hmm. All right, so as far as structure, right? So um, it's sort of interesting, right? Uh, Java uses both semicolons to denote line endings or statement endings and, um, and braces to set off blocks of code. Right, um, so and and that actually allows you to do kind of awful stuff. Um, like for example, I can do things like this. Um, man, if I can type, there we go. You know, this is valid Java code. Um, it's pretty awful. Uh, you guys weren't able to write this for 125 because check style won't let you do it. But um, but if you look at how the language is parsed, right. Um, semicolons are used to figure out where statements end, right? Now again, no one wants to read code like this, so this is bad, okay? Um, so in Python, we, you know, Python decided, and, and I think, you know, this was a kind of cool choice at the time, let's make white space meaningful, right? Um, so, you know, here's the same example in Python, you can see that there's no braces, right? And also no semicolons, right? So I can't write this gnarly single line assignment and then print statement. But I don't want you to be able to write that, right? So I'm cool with that. Um, now, of course, you know, if anyone has taken 196 in the past, I think they spend like a week at the beginning trying to, you know, distinguish between tabs and spaces in Python code. So uh, that's never been that fun. But um, Kotlin sort of splits the difference. So in, in Kotlin, what we have, we do have um, semicolons to set off our our blocks of code, sorry, braces to set off our blocks of code, similar to Java, but semicolons are not required. They are, you can put them in your code, if, and particularly if you're coming from Java, you may find yourself just doing stuff like this. Um, that's valid Kotlin code, it'll compile and run. Um, it's just not very elegant, right? So typically, you know, the, the linters that I've used, and if you use, uh, we may get you set up with IntelliJ this semester to write a little bit of a more significant piece of Kotlin code, um, it will sort of just whine about this. It'll say the semicolons aren't necessary, right? Now again, obviously I can't do things like this in Kotlin, um, and that's okay uh, because this is dumb. Uh, this is bad. I wonder if I can do it with the semicolon though. What do you think? Mm. Oh gosh, it's terrible. Okay, anyway, don't do that. So I can do it if I use the semicolon, but don't use semicolons. Right? And then you know this problem. 
All right, so let me, you know, you, again, a lot of you guys have seen the playground examples before in 125. Um, there, are, there are two different Java. So it, throughout the class, throughout today in particular, we'll be kind of comparing and contrasting Java code with, with Kotlin code and with some snippets of Python code that aren't, you know, interactive, but you can still look at. Um, just to give you a sense of kind of how the language design and some of the syntax design, particularly, is what we'll be looking at today, has evolved, right? Uh, you know, Java, let's see here. Uh, Java release date. Initial version of Java was 1996, right? Anyone, anyone know the answer for Python? 89, right? Um, is that right? No, no, no. Oh, no, no, see, it's... Wow. I did not know that Python was older than Java. Did anyone know that? When did it... Okay, let's look. Uh, Python 2... Oh, okay. <laughs> Python 2 was released in 2000. It's not clear... Did, did, has anyone even heard of Python 1 before? I guess that's a good point. Like, there is no... I had never heard of Python 1, but it apparently existed. Maybe... I don't know how many people use it, but Python 2 is probably the place where people started to use it, right? So that's 2000, right? So this is, you know, 10 years later, right? Kotlin, first version of Kotlin, I should know this, um, 2016, right? So it's like 20 years later, right? So this is, again, kind of showing you how syntax has evolved and how compilers have evolved throughout that time. So in our Java code, we have two different ways of running Java in the playground. This is what we use early in 125 because we don't want to scare students away with all this gnarly crap that you normally have to write in your Java code to get anything to work. Um, so essentially, the way these work, in case you're curious, is that they, we do some parsing and we template it into something that looks like this so that we can actually run it, right? Normally, you can't run this in Java. It's not valid Java. Uh, but we'll see both of these um, in, in this class, depending on what we need. Today we're basically going to look at snippets primarily because we're looking at you know variable initialization, small things like that. Okay. Um, the only thing to note, you know, if, if you're using this to play around with Java code, the main method here, since this is a tool that we wrote, I've taken the liberty of removing the unused string arguments from main um, because there's nowhere for them to come from. So if you want to write a main method in a class and get it to execute, don't have it take arguments. It's different than what you would normally do if you were starting from the from the command line. All right, so, so far, we may fix this at some point. Um, our Kotlin examples all require a starting point in a top-level function. Now, one of the things that's really nice about Kotlin is that this is valid Kotlin code right here. So unlike Java, not everything has to be wrapped inside a class. I can write a top-level method in Kotlin just like this, and this is fine. So, so far, you know, we may get to the point, particularly if we decide to you know, try to use Kotlin, you know, in, in 125, where we get to the point where we have like a snippet type environment that we can use for Kotlin. But so far, all the examples you're going to see today are, are wrapped in a main method. But the nice thing is this is completely valid Kotlin. By the way, stop me as I'm going along. You know, this is, a again, a smaller class than I'm used to. So you can see everybody. If you guys have questions, if you want to argue about something or whatever, something's not working, I, I would love to know that. Um, all right. So let's look at sort of basic variable in variables and typing in Kotlin. Because even here, I mean, this is simple stuff, but even here I think there's some really interesting uh, differences between Kotlin, Java, and Python that we can sort of look at and think about. So, you know, I, I, one of the things that turns off people about Java, uh, how many people here know both Python and Java? Okay, yeah. So, so again, I sort of see Kotlin as this, like, really pleasant brew of those two languages. Right? I think it's a language that is striving for Pythonic um, simplicity while also giving you lots of more elegant ways to structure your code, but retaining a lot of what was good about Java. Right? Okay, but, but here's something that was not good about Java. So for a long time, um, Java forced us to do things like this. Right? This is still valid Java code. I can run this and it will work. Right? Um, but, but look at what's happening here. So I've got a variable declaration and assignment, right? Variable declaration or variable initialization, right? Sometimes we call this, right? Um, but really what I've done is I'm telling Java, I have to tell Java twice what the type of this variable is, okay? I'm telling it once here 
in my type, uh, uh, the type parameter that goes along with the variable declaration. But I'm also telling it here, right? This is an integer literal. So already I've got some extra information in this code that I shouldn't need. And if you, and again, if you actually look, um, so I'm going to connect this with Go a little bit, right? So if you look at the history of, of programming language evolution, how many people here are taking 241? Oh, okay. How many people here have written a header file or seen a header file, like C++, for example, 225? Okay. So header files are an example of another piece of completely extraneous information, right? If you've ever written a header file and been like, been like, why can't the compiler figure this out? I just wrote the function over there, and I already, like, I said what the arguments were. Why do I have to duplicate this in this stupid header file? The answer is, it can. And so if you use languages like Go, and I don't know if Rust does this or not, you don't have to write header files. Like Go will just be like, okay, you wrote a method. You told me that you want to export that method out of this library. I can generate essentially the equivalent of a header file for you. Right. So, you know, we're seeing this balance of power change between the human and the compiler. It used to be that to make the compilers fast, the humans need to provide a lot of information, right? Now, the computers are this fast, we're starting to think, why do I have to tell you all this stuff, right? Why can't you, why can't you the compiler, be a little bit smarter and figure out some of this stuff for me? All right, now, I want to be fair to Java. Right? So Java, again, has decided to spin the version wheel very hard recently. So we're already up to Java 13, okay? But since Java 10, now that may sound like a long time ago, but Java 10 came out like last year, I think. Actually, maybe it was two years ago. Let's Google that shit. Java 10 release date. 2018, okay. So Kotlin was 2016. One of the things that's happening in the JVM ecosystem is that these newer languages like Kotlin, like Groovy, like Scholar are starting to push Java a little bit, right? So Java is starting to realize, hey, other people have found ways to write things that run on our platform. Maybe our language should keep up if we don't want to become totally irrelevant. So they've started to backport some of these features. So this down here, since Java 10, has been valid Java code. It's pretty nice, right? Does anyone use this in Java? If they've ever pro you guys program in Java? I don't really teach this at 125. I keep thinking this will be the year that I'll start doing it, and then I forget. And actually, I forgot already because I just talked about this, you know, yesterday. Um, so this is valid Java syntax, and this this is an example of Java catching up to Kotlin, right? So Java will now do what's called local variable type inference, you know. So I use this var keyword, which if might bring back nightmares if you've written some JavaScript. Um, and I give it a name, and I assign the value 4. And what Java can do, what the compiler is capable of, is say, OK, you're using a literal that's an integer literal to assign this variable. Therefore, it's an int. Right? So I don't have to provide the same piece of information twice within you know, one line. OK. Now, it's interesting, actually, the var modifier actually has the same meaning in Kotlin, but Kotlin has some other uh, subtlety, too. All right, so let's look at how this is done in Python. All right, and as I was thinking about this, I actually realized, you know, this, this on some level seems like, you know, the, the ideal. There is nothing to be taken away from this, right? There are, you know, three symbols here, and removing any one of them will render this statement completely meaningless, right? Now, here's what, but here's what's interesting about this, if you guys write Python, and I don't know, maybe you guys have a good way of doing this, but how can you tell whether or not i is a new variable or not? Do you have any idea if you see this line of Python? So this line could be doing two things. This line could be introducing a new variable called i into your local scope, or it can be modifying the value of a variable called i that you've already been using somewhere else. So in Python, this is impossible to tell. So it's sort of interesting to think about maybe we've taken a little too much away at this point, right? Maybe the little bit of type syntax clutter that Kotlin is going to introduce to this statement is worth it because it allows us to distinguish between declaration where we're introducing a new variable and assignment where we're modifying. All right, so here's, here's how this works in Kotlin. You guys saw this last time. Um, so, you know, Kotlin can, in many, many cases, infer the types of variables, particularly if you initialize them when you declare. So here, what I'm doing on line two is I'm saying I want to create a variable named i. I'm setting it to five. At that point, 
Kotlin knows two things. It knows that a variable named i exists and it knows the type because it's inferred the type from the literal that I used. After that point, it will enforce the type for me. So setting it to 10 is fine. Let's put this back. Let's see, this is going to work fine. Setting it to string, not fine. I'm going to get a type error. The compiler knows this. This is not a runtime error. This is a compile time error. Right? The the, uh, this, is, this is compilation. This is what you get for providing some types. So here's a little bit of a gnarlier piece of, of Kotlin code with a little bit more syntax clutter. And we'll talk about this when we talk about functions, not today. Um, but Kotlin can normally do this. Yeah. We'll get there. I'm all, yeah, I'm almost there. Yeah, yeah, great question. So the question is, what type is inferred when I provide something that you would think of as an integer literal? Yeah, we're, 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 re we're really close. It's like right here. Yeah. Um, so, and, and again, Kotlin's type, I just want to point out, and, and we'll see lots of examples of this, the Kotlin's type inference does not just apply to literals. It can also do things like figure out, in this case, that my function is declared to return an int. This is a function declaration syntax. Here you do have to provide types. We'll talk about why when we talk about functions. Actually, I think there's a really great reason for this. Um, so here I've declared a function called add that takes two parameters, x and y. Both those parameters are declared to be of type int and returns an int. The return type is over here on the right in comparison with Java. Again, we'll talk about functions next time. You guys can probably see what this is, right? But again, here I don't have to provide a type for my variable i because the compiler says, okay, well, I know that you're assigning the value of i based on the result of this function called add. I know what the type of add is, and we're good. So I know that i is an int. Okay. Now, and, and again, I, I, th this example is designed to both show the power of type inference, but also some of the limitations, right? So let me ask you a question. Where in this example can someone point out a place where Kotlin could infer a type but is not going to. I, all the types here are required. Let me just put it that way. There's one place here where I might be able to get away with Yeah. It should know the return type that you're adding to your yeah, so it should know the return type, right? So basically, it should be able to look at add and say, OK, you took two ints as parameters, and you're returning their sum. Their sum is still an int. So why can't I omit the uh, type parameter there? I think there's actually a really good reason for this. And the reason is it makes sure that you have returned something that's the correct type. So for example, if I say return not an int, now the compiler is, is helpful here, right? So and again, we'll talk about this when we talk about functions. But when I write a function declaration, what I'm really doing is I'm essentially telling, I'm, I'm establishing a contract with my program that says my function's going to return this type. And then Kotlin is going to help me make sure that I hold up my end of the bargain here, right? Mm -hmm. So if I return something that's not a string, not an int. Now, obviously, in a simple example like this, you might wonder, like, this is so dumb. Why not just do it for me? But when you start writing more complicated functions, this actually comes in handy. OK. So let's talk about Kotlin's types, right? So Kotlin, uh, all data in Kotlin, you know, again, you know, everything in the beginning, there was data, right? So how do we represent data in, in in Kotlin, um, Kotlin shares the same eight basic types of Java, right? So four integer types, two floating point types, a character type, and a Boolean type. There's a difference here, though. Uh, you can just keep reading, uh, but might also, and, and this also shows us for the first time the syntax for specifying a type when I declare a variable. So here you'll see there's no initialization of Boolean. Right? Small b boolean. I should have called these something else, sorry. Um, I didn't set this to true or false. And so there's no way for the compiler, if I don't set a value to the variable, there's no way that the compiler can infer the type. If I want to specify a type manually, um, the types in Kotlin for a variable go after a colon. So I have this, which we're going to come to in a minute, name of the variable colon type. If you guys have done a little bit of Java programming, what's interesting about these types? These match up with the Java primitive types exactly. They Java to primitive types, and these are all the same, except for one small detail. Yeah. They're capitalized. And what does that cause us to suspect? What's the typical convention in Java about type names? 
Mm, Dan, you already. Anyone remember? Yeah. Oh, you're getting to the right place. So, so the, the, the answer is, are these wrappers? Why would you think they're wrappers? Yeah, way in the back. Bingo. So in Java, typical, typically we capitalize the names of types that are object types, which is basically everything except for int, byte, short, long, double float, care, and boolean. These are, in fact, object types. Um, and I'll get to that in a sec. But Kotlin has no equivalent of Java's actual lower level primitive types. They don't exist. Okay. So, so and, and again, as you would expect, like Kotlin isn't, Kotlin is a beautiful language and I think you guys will find a lot of joy using it for your programs. It is not a mind reader, right? So there's no idea in this case on line three, like what type this variable is, you know? Like I have no, I, I don't know. So you gotta, you gotta give me something to work on, right? Um, so now let's comment this out. Now here this works. We'll come back and talk about why this other example doesn't work in a minute, but I just want to sort of start you thinking a little bit about this. This is an interesting error. You see this in Java too, right? Uh, in Kotlin this is particularly interesting. All right. So again, as I just mentioned, Kotlin does not have true primitive types like Java does. Java, and, and to be honest, if you guys have programmed in Java, this is something that's always irritated me about Java, right? Maybe I should just stop teaching the primitive types in Java, but the fact that there are these eight, you know, type of, eight, eight data types that basically behave differently than every other type on, that you'll ever encounter, right? They don't implement the basic object methods like to string, they don't uh, fall into the object hierarchy, right? Um, it's sort of weird. And so in Kotlin, they just, I think, decided, forget it. It's not worth it, right? So all of the basic data types are objects, meaning they have methods. So for example, here, <laughs> I've done something that probably looks really weird to you if you've written a lot of Java code, which is that I've declared an int called i, and then I'm calling i.dec, which, as you might suspect, decrements i. Right, so i is a reference to an object. It's not a doesn't hold a primitive value. Dan. Yeah. Ah, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. So the question is, if I leave it in uninitialized, what's the default value? Right. You saw up here. So this was interesting. Right. And this is why I did this example. That this code doesn't even compile. Okay. So. Now, this is also true in Java, right? So let's, let's go, you know, let's be fair to Java here. So let me find a Java playground. Uh, where is one? Okay, so if I do this in Java, right, I say int i. This is also going to give me the same error, right? So even Java can figure out that this is a problem, right? Even though it knows the type. Now, there is one place where this will work in Java. You guys might remember it. Uh, you have to sort of know what the default values of this. We'll get back to that when we talk about, uh, about classes. Okay. And, and again, as somebody pointed out before, the, the wrapper types, um, they're also referred to as boxing types. So for every one of those primitive types in Java, we have an associated, what they call boxing type, that wraps that in an object. Um, here's an example in, in Java. Right, so this is the capital I integer in Java. It is an object. I can assign an integer literal to it, but then I can call the methods that it provides. Right, and this again fits into the object hierarchy. Because you can, if you want to compare Kotlin and Java, you can kind of think of Kotlin as taking Java's type model, which it did. Right, I mean Java, you know, Kotlin objects share the type system that the Java um, Java created, but we just toss the primitive types overboard. They're gone. You know, so these weird exceptions are 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 removed. Pretty nice, actually. All right. So let's talk about the next thing that we start to see when we look at Java or, or Kotlin types, which is, which is concerns about mutability. All right. So we've been using this var keyword when we declare a variable. And that does have the effect of allowing us, again, which you cannot do in Python, unless, I don't know, you sprinkle your code with meaningless little comments or something. Um, to distinguish between declaration and reassignment, right? So on line three, I'm declaring a variable. On line five, I'm reassigning that variable. That var keyword makes sure that I can see the difference here, right? However, 
the var keyword isn't only there to indicate that I'm declaring a variable. It also says something about what I can do with that variable. Specifically, it says that the variable is mutable. It means I'm allowed to change the value. So again, here's the value. You know, again, this is just, you may not think there's anything special about this if you've used other languages. This should just work, right? I create a variable called i, I change its value to 12, and I printed it, and it's 12, right? And in Java, this is the default, right? So in Java, you know, our variables are mutable by default, and in Python, it's just that way, right? I'm not sure there's, I, I, actually, any of the Python hackers here, I looked this up beforehand, I'm not a Python hacker. Is there any way to create an immutable variable in Python? I think the answer is no, but I couldn't find it. All right. But in, so, so I, I wanna, you know, we've been talking for like half an hour, and we've been using var, and I feel bad about that because I really, Kotlin in many ways encourages you to use what's what are called immutable uh, data values, immutable variables. These are variables that cannot be changed after they are assigned. To create one of those, use a different keyword, val. Okay, maybe it's you know too bad that they only differ by one character, but var for things that are variable. Val for a value, right? Something that's not going to change. Your value should not change. Variables may, right? There's a lot of reasons why immutability is a good thing. It makes debugging easier. It makes uh, concurrent programming easier. It simplifies the compiler's life and allows it to optimize your code better. We'll get come back to those later in the class. Um, but for now, when we start looking at how to use variables and work with data in Kotlin, what we want to think about is how do we avoid using var? How do we avoid use creating a variable that can vary, right? A lot of times, whenever possible, we want to use val when we declare our variables um, to make sure that they can't change. So when you start using Kotlin, my, my suggestion is try to declare variables as val. If you end up needing to change it later, think about maybe if there's a way to restructure your code so you can avoid that. Right, rather than uh, changing it to var. There are places where you need mutable variables, you know, and, and you know, there, there's places where there's just no workaround, right? Um, but when possible, uh, try to make your variables immutable. Um, and again, co you know, Colin is one of, one of the things I really like about Colin as a language is it not only tries to get you to do things that allow you to produce good code, but it provides you with nice tools for doing those things, right? It just doesn't say make your data immutable. It gives you some nice tools and constructs for allowing you to, to make it easier to set uh, variables to be immutable. And we'll see those. We saw some of those last Friday. We'll see some of those today later, okay? So immutability also works really well with type inference, right? Um, so here, here's another way to think about val. When I declare a val, an immutable variable. I have to assign it immediately, right? I can't change it later, so I've got one shot. When I declare it, I've got to tell uh, Kotlin what its value is. And the process of telling Kotlin what its value is will almost always also tell Kotlin what its type is. And so, you know, again, let's see down here, I'm declaring a, a, a variable called mystery and because I'm not initializing it immediately, I actually have to tell Kotlin, this is going to store an int, and then I store an int into it on line six. On line seven, because it's a val, I have to put something that will assign its value on the right side of this expression. So again, just to be clear, this is my only chance to set the value of i, because i is marked as immutable. And so I've got something over there, in this case a call to this function add, that's going to do two things for me. It's going to set the value, but it's also going to ensure that Java knows what the type is. Sorry, Kotlin. Kotlin knows what the type is. Now, if you have programmed in Java and you've done some Java uh, programming, you probably know that Java provides uh, something that works this way. You know, so on some level, you know, keep in mind that Kotlin compiles down to bytecode just like Java. And so, you know, the syntax can be very different. Bytecode is a lot like assembly code. Has anyone taken 233 in here? You know, that's what bytecode is like. It's like these tiny little instructions that are run by this. Uh, but on some level, some of the same capabilities that the JVM is needed to support Java are reused in Kotlin in, I think, much more elegant ways, right? So again, I can, I can declare a variable in Java that can't be modified, 
And I, in order to do that, I now need like two pieces of syntax clutter, right? Now both the final keyword and an int. Okay? And then I can't reassign I, uh, but, but I don't want to do that. Okay. And, and again, we'll come back to this in a, in, in a minute. Well, we saw this last time, right? This is one of the places where these if expressions really come in handy. Because let's compare these two pieces of code. So this is Java on the top, okay? And I've got a variable that's a Boolean that I want to set based on some other variable. Because of how if statements work in Java and Python and JavaScript, I can't avoid this. There is no way to write this so that should cannot be mutable. It has to be mutable, right? Why? Well, I mean, one way to think about it is it's declared, it has to be declared outside of the if statement and set inside the if statement, right? So if I do something like this, I could say, you know, final Boolean should is equal to true, but then I can't access it outside this block, right? And if I declare it outside the block, then I can't mark it final because I can't set it inside the block, so I'm stuck. Right? So this, this, and, and this is a, you know, there are a lot of places like this, right? So, so again, you might be thinking, man, this looks, looks sort of silly. This guy's just making a mountain out of a mohill or whatever. But I mean, this type of pattern comes up a lot in code, right? And there's no, you know, this is, in, in one way to think about it, this is just kind of stupid, but it is stupid, right? It's stupid that because of how if statements work, I can't make this variable mutable, even if I want it to be immutable, even if I want to know that whatever else I do in my decide function, if I try to change the value of this Boolean, it's wrong, right? I might know that. I might know that I set should once, and then I should just only be using it later. And so if someone comes along and tries to change the code and modify the variable, that should trigger a problem, right? That's, a, that's an error, right? There's no way to do this in Java, okay? In Kotlin, we can use these if expressions that we looked at last time, right? So now what I'm doing is I'm taking advantage of the fact that I can use if on the right side of an expression. And, and if you think of, you know, again, think about, you know, how languages get designed, right? You know, Kotlin has come and merged into a world where, you know, I would argue, and we didn't really talk about this last time, but one of the things that we're going to be looking at this semester is we're going to be looking at, you know, what I would refer to as functional style program. So don't get scared. It's not Haskell or OCaml or something terrible like that, right? Um, but there are functional styles of programming that you can apply in languages that support functional programming idioms um, to make your code better and more clean and safer. And immutability is one of those things. Um, if you look at purely functional language, languages like Haskell, um, there is no notion of mutability. Like, uh, once you set a variable, it is set. It's done. You know? um, so, you know, Kotlin tries to give us good tools for doing this. So I think, you know, the people that designed it, you know, had written enough code like this that they decided, okay, how do we solve this problem? How do we figure out how to allow people to use immutable variables as much as possible, but also support really standard sort of decision-making constructs in code? And so this is an example of how to do that, right? And again, it is like so, I mean, it's just such a, such a nice, nice thing. All right. I'll run it just to make sure it works. Okay. Any questions at this point? I know it's boring. We'll get there. This is sort of fun, actually. So how many people have heard about the billion dollar mistake board before? Heard that term? All right. So can someone, can someone explain what that is to me? Billion dollar mistake. Someone who had, who had, who's heard the term. Yeah. Well, null. I don't even know pointers. Null references. Null anything. Right. So what? What is null? Who can describe this to me? You might go to interview for a company. That'd be a great interview question, actually. What is null? What is it? Zero. No. Nothing. nothing. Such an existential question, right? <laughs> what is nothing? Right. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, this uh, nothing is the closest answer to the truth, right? Um, so, so null is a value that a variety of different languages have adopted to indicate to indicate basically that something is not ready to be used, that it's not set, that I c I'm not supposed to be able to use it. All right. As a programmer, no, now this causes problems, 
because if I use that thing that's not ready to be used, typically the program is going to crash, right? And, and keep in mind, these are crashes. These are runtime errors. It's not a compile time exception. It's not like, oh, the compiler caught a type error with my code. No, this means a crash. This means you get a pager, your pager goes off, right? This means that you don't get that Series C round of funding because you went to demo your app and it crashed, you know, on Sand Hill Road. Um, this is what this means. These are bad, okay? So Tony Hoare, who's sort of been, um, been uh, given credit um, for null, has apologized and, and referred to this as the biggest mistake he made when designing the language that gave birth to this idea. And the billion dollar mistake, the, the, the number comes from the fact that, you know, and again, who knows if it's a billion dollars, it might be like a trillion dollar mistake, right? The damage that null has caused to computer software around the world, right? In terms of lost productivity, time, energy, you know, actual, I mean, uh, to be honest, I don't want to like go out on a limb here, right? But I suspect null has probably killed people, right? Like if you've lost that much money at this point, software problems have caused problems with airplanes and cancer treatment devices and stuff like that. So I suspect that there's probably some, at least one or two fatalities associated with null as well, right? And, and one of, you know, this is actually one of the nicest features about uh, Kotlin, right? Is, is two things, right? First of all, Kotlin provides great ways to avoid using null, to avoid even having to deal with it in the first place. And then when you do have to deal with it, because there are times when you just can't sort of get away from it, right? So Colin is kind of like, okay, here's all these great tools for not having to use null in your programs. But if you do, I will also give you an equally great set of tools for making it safe, as safe as possible, all right? This is really, really nice, right? Okay, so, um, and, and here's the problem with null too, right? Which is that a lot of languages provide you with no help Okay, so this has to be like the stupidest two lines of code in the entire world. Every time I run this code, I am shocked that I can do this. It is so dumb, right? I am setting something to null, and then in the next line, I'm trying to dereference it, and it is going to crash, right? Now, this is 2020, and the Java compiler, now, I, I, again, when you run these playgrounds, and maybe I'll fix this to make it more clear, the, the playground also always doesn't um, distinguish between a compile time error and a runtime error. Right? This is a runtime error. This is the, you know, no VC funding for you, no F on your final project, right? Like, this is the error that causes problems. It's not the one you catch in development. It's like, okay, no, no worries. My code didn't compile. I'll fix that. This is something that explodes in a customer's face, right, in a user's face. <laughs> Why does Java allow me to do this? It's so idiotic, right? Like if I worked at Oracle, I might just put in a special check into the compiler just for this use case, right? It's like if you've assigned a variable to null on one line and then on the next line try to dereference that, maybe at least we could catch that one, right? Like doing this for real is actually really hard, right? That's the reason why Java C doesn't do it, right? is because this is like the, the worst possible case. In a lot of cases, I have a reference and I don't know whether it's null because I called a function and the function might have returned null and I just don't know, right? Um, but I forgot to check and things went, went kaboom, right? In Kotlin, you cannot do this. That's one of the nice things about the language, okay? So, and, and you know, if you write, I just want to point this out. So if you write industrial strength Java, right? If you write Java at a big company, that does it right, that uses a lot of libraries and external tooling, you will probably not have to worry about this as much because there's, over the years, even though the core Java language has not done much to help us with null, there's all sorts of good annotations and other tricks that people have come up with for dealing with null, right? And so if you look again at production quality um, Java code, you'll see a lot of indications of whether a particular value should be able to store null or not, right? Uh, but these are outside of the core language. These are things that people have layered on top of Java in a desperate attempt to solve this problem. Okay. So let's talk about uh, one of the ways in which we work with null in Kotlin. 
Okay? One of the places where this comes up is when you declare variables. In Kotlin, you must make a choice at this point in your program about whether or not whether or not your variable can store null or not. All right? Two choices. Yes or no. If the answer is no, now, now the default is no, okay? So if I, if I use uh, Kotlin's type inference, this variable can change, okay? But it cannot change to null. This is not okay, right? Contrast this with Java. Let me go find that Java example with the, uh, with the integers. Where was that one? Right, because I can't normally set, I, I, in Java, I can't set in an int to null because null is not a valid int value. But I can do that. There you go. So any, you know, without that extra support that people have created, um, you know, I don't have any way to, to avoid this. But in Kotlin, this will not compile, right? When I initialized I on uh, line two, Kotlin said, okay, the type is int, but it's a non-nullable int. So throughout the rest of the program, Kotlin is gonna make sure that I do not assign null to this, this, this value, this variable can never store null, ever. Doesn't matter what its type is, strings, any sort of object class we create later, the eight primitive types, basic types, maybe better way to call them, nothing, can't do it, okay? If you want a nullable type and you're willing to deal with all of the headaches and all of the pain that this may cause, you postfix the type name, and again, this is true for any type, this was, and it doesn't matter. You don't have to do anything special with the types you create in Kotlin to get the support. It's just built in. Question mark. Right? And this is something, actually, that I think is, I, I don't know where they, where they found this, but this question mark syntax is kind of appropriate, right? Because the idea is, I don't know what's in there. It could be an int, or it could be, right? Like, it could not be ready for me to use. And so if I'm willing to deal with that, and like I said, Kotlin has great tools for helping you with this, great language support for this. It's almost impossible. If you want your Kotlin code to go boom, you have to try, right? It won't let you, right? You guys are all adults, but you have to try. So, so again, this is a nullable int, right? And I can print it. I can always print null. That's a safe thing to do. It's just going to print null, right? Um, but if I try to do something like, let's try to call a two-string method on this. Oh. Yeah, null apparently has a two-string method. Let's try to call like hash code or something that, that shouldn't work. No, nope, I guess null is a hash code. Uh, can we call too long? There we go. Haha, <laughs> okay. That's actually kind of nice, actually. <laughs> null has always deserved a hash code, and zero seems like the appropriate number. Um, all right, so this is something that an only an int should have, and you'll see that only safe or non-asserted calls are allowed on, and, and we will talk about what those are, right? Uh, when we talk more about the support for null. But this is a compiler error, right? This code did not make it into production. Uh, because, and, and again, it's sort of like, one way to think about it is, as long as you don't use null, nullable types, you're good. There's a lot of ways you've like, you know, people talk about foot guns, right? Like, you've avoided that particular foot gun, or at least you've pointed it slightly farther from your foot. If you start working with something that might be null, then Kotlin is gonna force you to, to handle it like it's a little radioactive, right? Like it might cause problems because it might, right? And again, we'll talk next, we'll talk at some point in the future about how to, how to do that. All right, questions at this point? We're doing great. Okay, let's talk about conditionals. This will go, this will go pretty quickly, right? Uh, Kotlin has if else, yep like every other major programming language. And it works pretty much the same. Uh, except for these conditional expressions we'll talk about in a minute. So Kotlin does not have switch, but it has something more powerful. It's called when, right? There's a couple different examples of when. Um, here's one here. Again, this is a when statement. Um, if I provide something in parentheses after the when, then that becomes, you know, something that's evaluated in the context of these things on the left. 
So what is this doing? So essentially I'm passing in whatever the value of i is at the top of this expression. And it says when i is 10, and then there's this arrow syntax, and I have, um, this is a little, like a little lambda, right? I can put braces here if I want to. That'll also work, uh, except for the indentation it's going to complain about, right? Or I can omit them. Again, this is one of those places where Colin is just really, really clear, okay? This in syntax, we'll come back to, okay? But you can, you can mess around with the value of i and figure out what this does. And then else. Else is something that's probably familiar to us uh, from using other, uh, from using if else. Else is the catch-all. Else is if I get here, nothing else is true. Okay? I like this form of when as well. So if you don't provide an argument, then what you provide on the left side of your when uh, conditional is a, um, a conditional statement. Right, something that needs to evaluate to true or false. Right, so now I can say, so this is almost the equivalent of, I think it is the equivalent basically of this, right? Where, but I'm, 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 I'm writing it slightly differently. I didn't pass I in here, and so now what I'm doing are providing things that need to evaluate to true or false. And these are, and then go over this, and hopefully I don't need to, you know, standard, you know, uh, comparison operators that will be familiar to from Java. Okay. Any questions about when? When is kind of cool. There's another form of this um, that's really, really useful for doing type checking. That we'll come back to. All right. So there's essentially a way to use when to uh, distinguish if you have a variable that could have multiple types, right? Which is true, just like it's true in Java because of polymorphism. Um, when allows you to do a nice form of type checking and to take different actions depending on what the type of the variable is. We'll get back to that when we talk more about Kotlin's type system. Okay. And, you know, I don't know, I just really like these, so just, just permit me to kind of, you know, gloat about these again. I have to say, I've been writing some, you know, JavaScript code to, to, to support the website and stuff like that, and I'm like, when are they going to add this to JavaScript? I, I need it. I can't go back to life before these conditional expressions. They're so nice. Um, it just makes me sad every time I have to not use one. Um, both when and if can be used on the right side of an assignment. All right, so here's an example. Obviously, this is pretty nice, except for the grading scale, which is a little, <laughs> a little abrupt. Um, the, you know, and so here what I'm doing is I'm testing percent. These are ranges. Um, and the result of the win statement is going to be a, a string. So grade is going to have type string. And this will work fine, right? Except for the fact that, again, this poor, this poor person that thought they were going to get a B is not going to do well. Um, okay. And, and so, so again, like there is, um, this, this is really one of these places where I just want to emphasize how this fits in with the other goals of the Kotlin language, right? Grade can be immutable. It should be. Maybe it's not. Maybe I need to apply some extra credit or whatever, so I might have changed this. But um, actually, I probably do that before I compute the letter grade, right? Um, but I can compute the immutability, and, and uh, grade does not have to be nullable, right? I can use a non-nullable type. So I get the null safety here, and I also get the immutability uh, because I can use these on the right side. Um, here's the same thing uh, using if else. You can see here that when is another one of these constructs that can be really, that can, that can uh, allow you to write really elegant code, right? And it's not just because it's shorter. I don't want to, um, I don't want to, you know, fetishize the number of lines of code that you write. I think that's a mistake. You can find you know, one-liners in languages that are completely unreadable and make no sense. Um, so when we look at elegance, I mean, part of it has to do with when I'm when I'm trying to see what's actually happening. How much of a dis how much of syntax distraction is there around the statement, right? So in the win statement, I have these in operators arrange and then the grade, and so there's very little extra syntax there that's kind of in the way. If you write this using if else you end up with all these if-else statements and stuff like that, and it, it starts to look messy. Um, if you write something, that, you know, uh, IntelliJ, uh, which maybe we'll work on setting up on Friday, if you write this in IntelliJ, at some point, it'll basically be like, please convert this to a when statement. It's hurting my eyes, right? And it'll actually do it for you, which is pretty nice. 
One of the things I want to point out, just so it's clear, well, actually, it's not clear because you guys haven't used this type of language construct before, right? Um, when you use an if or when as an assignment, this is weird, right? Like, what is this F doing all alone here on the line? Um, the last thing in a block is what's yielded by the if statement, right? This is new because normally if statements didn't do this. They just decided which block of code to run. But this if statement is actually returning a value. Now, you don't want to use return here. If you return, you're going to return on the function main, right? Instead, what I do is I just have a value alone on a line. And that value is what grade will be set to if I enter this branch. I can put other things inside there, right? And actually, this is really useful. I found myself doing this a bunch where I, depending on the value of something, I need to perform a couple actions and then also yield a result, right? So here, I'm printing something. And then the last thing I do is return the grade, right? A little bit of a contrived example, but this turns out to be pretty useful in practice. The last thing is that when I'm doing this, you might wonder uh, what happens if the variable doesn't get set. So in this case, I'm setting a val. There's no type information provided, and it's not nullable. So I have to set it out of this, OK? In that case, it's not a, uh, Kotlin will not allow me to avoid using an else statement. I have to have an else, because the only way for it to guarantee, see, it's going gonna, it's gonna to complain, right? The only way for it to guarantee that grade gets set to something is if this code cannot fall through, right? It has to hit one of the branches. And so if I put an else there, I'm good. All right, questions about these conditionals? Yeah. Oh, with when? Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't understand you. I thought you meant with one, and I was like, yeah. So yeah, the, the question is, how do I print and assign with when? So the first thing I need to do is I need to create a block, which we, did, which we were avoiding before. And now I can put anything I want in here, right? Um, no, that person's grade isn't good enough to earn the wow. There you go. That makes sense? Yeah, so and, and, and you know, this is one of those places where I'm sort of teaching Kotlin by induction. You guys are starting to see, so, so, so this is sort of interesting, right? It's like what's happening over on the right side here, right? This, this is not something that we're used to seeing in Java where I can just sort of like delimit something in blocks and it sort of gets run but also yields a result. So we'll, we'll come back and talk about what this is and how it works, right? But if I want to do this inside a when, um, here, let's see if I can do this also just for fun because I don't think I'm going to be able to do this, but I'm curious. Um, yeah, okay. No, no, it doesn't like that. <laughs> so if, if I want to if I want to run some statements, I need to... No, it's really angry with me. What did I do wrong? Oh, I forgot it. There, okay. Sweet. Great question. All right. Let's, let's just finish with some looping constructs, and this will sort of bring us to a, a nice stopping point for the day. Um, I have looping constructs in Kotlin. I don't want to spend very much time on them, so I'm glad I got them with only a couple minutes left. Um, because one of the things I'm going to try to get you guys to do this semester is stop using loops. Uh, because Colin provides great support for doing most of the things you want to do with loops using more functional idioms like, uh, like map and filter. But if you need a loop, you got a loop. Here's your loops. While pretty much what you're used to. Um, however, the for loop in Kotlin is interesting. It's different. So the while loop looks identical. The for loop, the th your, your standard three-part for loop, has been tossed overboard in Kotlin. It does not exist. Okay? There is no, this is just invalid syntax. Like, there's not any way for me to fix this. It's just raw. Right? I can't put three parts inside a for loop like this. Instead, the, the, the right comparison for a for loop is Java's for each loop, or the enhanced for loop. Should, at some point, I guess, should we stop calling it enhanced? Because it was enhanced like 20 years ago. So I don't know. It's that's just now normal. So you guys remember this? And th this is you know valid Java syntax, right? I have an array, or actually anything that's iterable on the right side of my uh, for loop, and on the left side, I have a variable that's going to receive 
each value from values one at a time. The way this is done is actually more complicated than you think. I can make anything iterable in Java. I can make an infinite iterator if I want to. Um, but when you use it with arrays, it just kind of does what you expect. In Kotlin, I can do something very similar. Um, next time, we'll talk a little bit about collections and some of the other things. Nice built-ins. We talked about a little bit about this last time, right? So this is, this is the equivalent of my statement up there on line one. I'm declaring a list of values. To declare a list in Kotlin, I use the list of operator. I pass it the values I want in my list. That's what I do up there, right? Don't need to provide any types here. The compiler is smart enough to know that this is a list, and then it contains integers, right? And if I try to, well, let's see what happens if I try to do something like put a string in here. I think this is going to complain. Oh, no, it, uh, it, it so actually, well, what do you think just happened? Anybody want to guess? Why was I allowed to do this? I can't do this in, in, in Java. This won't work. Right? Yeah. Why can I do it in Kotlin? What just happened? Yeah. Nope. Remember, this is not an, a small i int. It's a capital I int. Yeah. Yeah, this is now a list of objects. Because everything got upcast to object, right? Um, and and I, I could, if I if I knew how to do it, I would I could probably print off what the type is. But um, but anyway, so if I but I I don't want a list of objects. I want a list of ints, and so that's what I have. And so this I can't remember. Is this how Python works now? Does Python have in or is it? Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing, right? Okay. Now, so the uh, thing I'll leave you with today, and we'll come back and talk about this next time, because actually I think this is a really nice example of um, how Kotlin works and, and, and how Kotlin has generalized certain things. So what if I want like a real numeric loop? So I've showed you how to loop through lists, and this also applies to arrays and anything that I can iterate through. But what if I want a loop, like what if I just want my good old for loop? I just want to print me some numbers, right? Because that's what, you know, uh, that's what high-impact pr computer programs are known to do. I just want to print some numbers. Um, I can do that in Kotlin, and here's how. Okay. So this is the same for loop. This is the only for loop we have in Kotlin. And but what I have here on the right, this is called a range. Right. One of the things that's going to trip you up about ranges, and to be honest, this is just about the only thing I don't like about Kotlin. Does anyone, anyone see what's we a little bit weird about this? That doesn't always make me super happy. Yeah. What's that? You can, actually. There's a, uh, we'll, we'll come back to this. So the question was, can I adjust the step? You can. And there's actually kind of a nice syntax for doing it. I'm not, I didn't show it here because I figured this would be a good stopping point. But what's the first value that was printed here? What's the last one? It's inclusive. It's weird, right? Like if you write a for loop, it's like i is less than 10, I get 0 through 9, right? Here, 0 through 9 literally gives me the number 0 through 9. So it's just something to keep in mind, okay? Maybe they did this because they don't want you to use this to go through lists, right? Because if I did, it would have to be from 0 through list.size minus 1, right, to get all the valid indices. What's cool about this is that, oh, is that in Kotlin, ranges are an actual object. So I can do this. There it is, right? So this isn't some special weird syntax that I can just use inside a for loop. A range is an object that's a first class citizen in the language that I can use on the right side of an assignment, right? So you, I can imagine t writing like a helper function that would take a range and then going through a list and going through those objects. And now I can pass any range into it I want, right? So this is just, th this syntax is just a particular way of initializing a range object. All right, that's where I'm stopping today. You guys have any questions before we pack up? Yeah. I, th I, I don't think it's a, just an array. I think it's something that supports iterable, but I suspect it's probably a little smarter than just storing an array. Because think about it. Um, 
if I want to iterate through the numbers 0 through 9, what do I need to know? Like three pieces of information, start, end, and which one I'm at right now. So storing all the numbers between 0 and 9 would be very inefficient. Right? No, that makes sense? Right? So I suspect it's some sort of object that knows where it should start, where it should end, and then as I start to iterate it, what its current state is. Yeah, great question. How would you do that? Hmm, let's see here. Um, well, let's do the first seven powers of two. Uh, I'm just, I have no idea if this is correct or not, but we'll find out. I think that actually run for me. No. Is it, how do I do exponentiation in? I have never had to do exponentiation in Kotlin. Pow, there we go. It's going to give me a double, though. That's sort of too bad. Uh, okay, so let's do 2.pow. Yeah, two dot two double dot pow. No, it's angry. Let me come back and we'll 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 start up with this next time. But th but there are but there are sort of standard ways to go through ranges uh, one element at a time. Um, it's not. Oh. Is it two list? There's a way to get a list out of a range. As list. No, okay. Okay, we'll start up here next time. There's things about Kotlin I still don't know. Other questions? Maybe ones I can answer. Yeah. So if numbers are objects, uh, array, like, uh, like Java, like, uh, cafe, uh, cafe, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so the so, so the question is, how do I convert these? How do I convert things back and forth, right? That I think I can do, right? So, for example, I can actually, um, is it too long? It's one of these. There we go. Oh, gosh, I'm still running Java. <coughs> yeah. So if I want to do these type of conversions, Every one of the numeric types has too long, too double, right? It has a variety of different things, right? So, like, I could do too double, right? Let's say I want to initialize a variable, and I want it to have the type double, but I want to initialize it with 10. Here's how I would do it, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's do this. Oh. Double dot pow. Oh, is it as double? No, just like this. It's weird. Looks like it should be able to. Oh, you know what? the problem. I think it's... No. We'll get it next time. Sorry. Other questions? Well, let's try this first. Let's see, if we, let's see if we actually got the list out of here correct. There we go. So that works. It's just the map that's causing this problem. Yeah. Oh. Kotlin dot math. All right. There we go. Oh, there. Now I can sleep tonight. And of course, you know, if you wanted to, I don't think we need the to double here, but to int to get it back to an int. 
There you go. Sweet. Reassuring that computers can still do math. Other questions? You'll see here there's no loop here, though, right? Which is good. Yeah. Question? We'll get here. This is like stuff that we'll get to down, down, down the line, right? Um, particularly sort of map reduced type syntax. This is an example of, you know, a particularly nice way of doing this. You'll see that there's, there's nothing, there's no mutability here. There's no value that's ever being changed. Right. What I got out of here is an, in, an immutable list um, that has just been transformed. Yeah. What's that? Uh, oh yeah. Okay. So the, the so that's so so this is this is a good question. So the, and and I actually I had an example of this. Right. So let's do. So so the question becomes. What do I do if I want to initiate? I, I want this to be a type double, okay? So the type it's going to be right now is um, it's going to be an int, okay? So this is a way of doing a, a, a type check in colon, right? This statement, this is syntax. So double is int, okay? What if I want it to be a double? Well, I might think I could do this, kind of force. Kotlin to do it. Um, now it's angry because <laughs> it's an integer literal, right? So I could go over here and do 10.0 and then, um, oh, sorry, it's instance of int, I think. What's that? Instance of, no, I spelled it right. Type of, thank you. There we go. Oh, no, no, never mind. Forgot it. This will work though. This is now a double, right? <laughs> Sweet. All right. So look, <laughs> I I got a couple options here. I can do this. If you don't just mind, like I mean, people have used Python, right? Like this is what you have to do in Python, right? If you want, if you really want something to be a double, I wonder if this works. Let's find out. Right, so I got to use 10.0, or I can do this. That also works. And if I call it two double, <laughs> there you go. So those are your options. 